We're talking about the life of King David. And King David is, has, uh, was anointed long ago. You know, his, the first king of, was Saul. Saul, uh, Saul started out good. He was the tallest guy. He was the most handsome guy. He was a gifted man. He was a person of intelligence. But his heart kept getting farther and farther and farther from God. And finally, finally God pulled the plug. It left him as king for a time. But the anointing was gone. The direction of God, the hope and the help was gone because Saul just absolutely refused to do things to glorify God. You know, if you know the history, you know that God never intended them to have a king in the first place. God wanted to be their king. And he wanted to rule the people, communicate his heart to the people through, through uh, the prophets and through judges. And, uh, and that worked for a period of time. But the time came when the people just insisted they, they needed a king. And so God gave them hope and gave them a king. And that king led them from the Lord and more than to the Lord. And finally that king was <coughs> removed. Saul and his son Jonathan. Jonathan, his son, was a tremendous man of God. He's probably one of God's people in the whole Bible. And yet he loved his dad. He was faithful, served his dad. He ended up losing his life with his dad in the battlefield. And now David, though he had been anointed earlier, now it's, it's here. It's, it's his time. One of the things that David does, he realizes that the Ark of the Covenant is not where it should have been. And it was not the center of their life as it should have been. The Ark of the Covenant, if you if you don't know what I'm talking about, what, there, there was a movie that got kind of a, it was just a, I don't know that it had much truth in it, but what was the one about the Ark? The Raiders of the Lost Ark. The idea, that I, I can think of the song, I couldn't think of the name of the movie. The Ark of the Covenant was uh, was not just something for that movie, it was it represented the presence of God and the holiness of God. And when the children were in the wilderness, that the ark was there. God told Moses exactly how he wanted to be built, and he told him exactly how it needed to be transported. And so uh, David, in his in his zeal, wanted that ark to be the center of their life. And so he called together. He kind of had a committee, if you will. He contacted the leaders. And the leaders are going, yeah, buddy, we're with you. And so they went to get the ark, and as they're moving it, they put it on a new cart. And God didn't say he was a cart. God told them how to move it. He said, move it with, a, with, with poles, acacia poles, and, and that it was to be moved only by the priest, that you weren't to touch the ark. Well, David, in his zeal, David, in his zeal, so got a new cart. And they put a new cart on it. And they're moving it. And as they're moving along, the people are just, they're jumping and shouting and they're praising God. And they're having a hallelujah time. And they come to a place and the oxes stumble a little bit. And it looks like the cart, it looks like the cart may, you may, may, you know, could turn. And so one of the men, named, uh, a man named U-Z-Z-A, was his name, and he reached out to, to, to steady, the, steady the Ark of the Covenant, and he touched it with his hand. Now, God has told him specifically, do not ever do that. There needs to be a space between the holiness of God and our everyday life, and, and, and that was a big deal to God more than it would be to just the, you, you and I. In fact, before they brought them into the promised land, they told Joshua to take, tell the priests and who carry the ark that they're to carry the ark and that they're to go and it is the priests who are carrying the ark who step into the water first in the Jordan's in flood stage, man. I mean, there's no way you're getting across that. And they step in it by faith. And God told Joshua, and he did it, that when their feet went in the water, God stopped the water. He just started walling the water up, an invisible dam, if you will. I mean, it's hard to imagine. When you see that, we'd have to make a believer out of everybody because who's ever seen a wall of water? It's just water. And there it is, and the water keeps flowing, and it keeps building. And so the guy, as soon as they carry the ark, 
And so they begin to walk through on dry ground. That's how the people entered into the promised land in the first place. So God has a, a lot tied up in this ark. And he has a lot tied up in the way that we're to revere him. And in that case, revere the ark. That's the closest representation we had of the spirit of God. Well, well, guess what? Take David didn't, didn't take the time to, or, or give it the effort or, or ask the priest. And so they got this thing on a new cart. And then the thing is starts to fall. And this Uza, you think he's doing a good thing. I mean, if I had been there, I'd have done it too. He put out his hand and tried to study that thing. Well, when he did, God took his life. He said, what? God took his life. See, God is a holy God. And he's got a way of doing things. And when we come to the Lord, we just can't say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. Lord, here's what I'm going to do. Then here's what I'm going to do. Then here's what I'm going to do. Then here's what I'm going to do. God help me because I'm getting ready to do great things. That isn't how it works. We're going to serve the Lord. You better come to the Lord broke and say, Lord, I don't know how to come in and go out. I don't know what you're going to have me do. But whatever it is you're going to have me do, you're going to have to help me or I won't be able to do it. But I'm going to follow you, Lord. Let this be about you. That, that has to be in our heart, doesn't it? It's in my heart when I'm telling you. That's the only way you can follow the Lord. You can't say, man, I'm going to do great things for the Lord. I'm going to feed the homeless. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 13? Remember what it says? It says, I can. What's it say? Young people, now we memorize this, some of us. And leaders, we memorize it. How does it start? If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I become a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, but and have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I have and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. In other words, just doing things, just going and doing things, even though your heart is you really want to honor the Lord, God has plans. That's what Kathy was sharing with God has a plan. He has a purpose for our life. And he'll bless us as we'll wait upon him and find that plan, find that purpose. And, that, and, and so when we don't do that, there's consequences. Well, David, David, I mean, can you imagine? They're having a wing day. They're having a party. They're having a celebration. I mean, they're, they're dancing. They're blowing trumpets and, and everything else. And all of a sudden, boom, death hits the camp. He's dead. And, and so and David gets angry. You know, it's like God messed up his party. <coughs> so they, they leave, they put, the, they put it in a safe place, and they come back. That's just happened. And now the, now the verse I'm getting ready to read. <coughs> verse 4, I'll just start at the beginning from chapter 14. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David with cedar trees, masons, and carpenters to build a house for him. So here's a neighboring king sends all kinds of building materials, expensive stuff, and they've got workers and they're going to build a house for David. And David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. That's the text. And David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel. This meant something to me when I read it days ago because I just had this thought. You would say it was a random thought. It was kind of a it was kind of an aha moment, but it's so it's so simple. You're gonna think, well, Pastor, I it just dawned on me, it just occurred to me. I've been pastor 20 years, 21 years. And it, it hit me in a special way that we had some decision to make. It wasn't some life and death thing. It was just some decision to make. And, and I'd ask the Lord and he helped me to make it. And then all the people that knew it accepted that decision. And then it dawned on me that God has made me the pastor. And he's doing what he wants. And it really hit me. 
really. And it wasn't, I can't even tell you the decision. It wasn't. I just had had that moment. I mean, that. You said, well, Pastor, you really didn't know you were a pastor for 20 and a half years? And it just now get you? Well, I guess. Never hit me like that. There's a sobriety to it. More than ever before. And so when I read this, I, it, it meant something to me that it, that it probably didn't mean to you when I just said it. David is king now, and here comes another king, and this king is honoring David. He's honoring Israel. He's bringing all these building supplies. And David realized, I could add for the first time, maybe, I'm adding that. David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. David got this sense, this aha moment. David, son, this ain't about you. It's not about you. God has chosen a man. A man that later he would say was a man after his own heart. And caused him to be king. But was he a perfect man? No. Oh, somebody just died right in the middle of, a, of your, the highest celebration that Israel had had in anybody's lifetime. And in the midst of it, a man dies. The Bible says that you and I, that we have this treasure, the Spirit of God, the presence of God in our life. We have this treasure. But it's in an earthen vessel in order that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God, not of ourselves. We make a terrible mistake when we think that we can do God's work without depending entirely on God's word to know how to do His work. The, the same thing is true if you're a mom. Same, same thing is true if you're a dad. You need God's help every moment to know how to guide your children, how to guide your family. Without God's help, you, you, you wouldn't know because God sees everything. He's on the seeing side. He knows everything. Your decision, if you let God lead you, will be in line with His everything He's seeing, everything He's hoping, which you can't see. The decision that he causes you to make, if you live a life submitted to him, open to him, you'll be able to look back in your life and say, oh my Lord, oh my God, you had us do this and this and this and this, and it seemed unrelated, yet now I can see God that was you from beginning to end. That's the kind of life I want to live. Don't you, I mean, when you come to the end of your life, don't you want to find out, oh God, this, she was my wife. Oh God, that was where you had me to work. Oh Lord, it was this. It was that. When you look back and see, but the Bible says that that's not going to be true for most people. Did you know that? The Bible says at the end of the time, we're going to come before God with our works. And, and for most people, most of their works are going to go up in smoke. It'll be like wood and hay and stubble and straw. The Bible says the only thing that's going to last in your life, in my life, the only thing that's eternal the only thing that's good for anything in the eternity, in other words, let me say it that way, are the times that we stepped in the order of Almighty God. So if that's true, and in the Bible, this, the word for if and since is the same word. If that's true, since that's true, shouldn't we be careful of what we do? Shouldn't we be careful? I, I'm not saying you be a basket case and be sick and at your, you know, in your, in your insides all the time because you're so worried. But we, we as people, what can we do? Well, we, we can spend time in God's Word. One of the best ways to know God's will is to, is to spend time with Him in His Word. Now, you can't, you, can't, you can't say, okay, Jesus did it this way one time, so that's the way I'm going to ever do everything. Because God's not like that. He does, does everything differently. But it's always the same Spirit. <laughs> If we can spend time with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit of God, so the Holy Spirit will, 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 will invade your life if you give Him an open door. If you don't give Him an open door, I mean, you can be a preacher, you can be a teacher, you can, and the whole life will never know 
what it's even like to have the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Or you can be a little child, like that little buddy back there deep and wide. You can see in that little guy's face, the Lord was helping that little booger. And we're all going through that. Mm, and mm, that is the silliest song I ever heard. <laughs> but if we'll give our children, give our sons, give our daughters, give our husbands, husbands, give our wives, if we'll give them that freedom to walk, God can do in us what He wants to do. That's what that whole 2911 is. But there's a fearful side of it. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. When Laura was in college, this has been a while back, huh? But she told me about a, a professor that she had and, and the ideas that the professor was giving to her. And, and I didn't want to be critical or mean, but I said, well, honey, that person just doesn't know the Lord. The Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And if you've got no fear of God, you don't even know him. You, 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 can't, you haven't even found the starting gate. Everything you do, everything you teach, everything you're going to do, it's going to be human wisdom. And in the end, it's all going to go, it's going to be burned. It's going to be shot. There, there is something that David had to have known. There is something that the priest at the time had to have known. A time when God told Moses way before. First of all, God doesn't want you to have a king. But the time's going to come and the people are going to say, we, we need a king. We want a king because everybody else has a king. You know, your kids ever do that? But mom, everybody's going to the party. But mom, everybody's skirt always comes up to their belly button. But mom, everybody does this. But mom, all the third graders got eye makeup. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, but mom, but mom, but mom. Everybody's doing it. And what I remember, even in my days, and these were like dinosaur days. My mom would say, son, if everybody jumped off a cliff, would you do? See, he's going word for word. Because my mom and his mom, they must have been on the same thing. That's, that's the stupidest logic in there anyway. I'm going to do it because everybody's doing it. Yeah. I want you to turn to the words that God gave Moses. But they are words that I think, for the most part, were forgotten. It's in Deuteronomy. Go to the very beginning in Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. <clears throat> and I'm in the 17th chapter. You know, one of the reasons as Christian parents, as Christian young people, <clears throat> one of the reasons that we spend time in the Word is because the Word will bring us back and will anchor us to the things that are the things of God. Without an anchor, guys, we're toast, aren't we? Without an anchor, we're liable to be blown this way and blown that way and washed up here and capsized over there. We need an anchor. God knew this was going to happen. I'm in Deuteronomy 17, 14. These are Moses' words. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you shall possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one among your countrymen, so you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourself who is not your countryman. Now God tells us something really kind of uh, Interesting here. I don't know if you caught it or not. Is it God's will to have a king in the first place? No. But he said, don't choose any king. Choose the one the Lord chooses for you. Does that seem confusing? See, God says, I don't want you to have a king. But I know your heart. And I know that you're dead set against everything I desire to have a king. You know, I've heard people talk about God's will, God's perfect will, and God's permissive will. I don't spend a whole lot of time with that, but it's, it's appropriate here. God's perfect will is He doesn't want you to have a king in the first place. His permissive will is if you're going to do it anyway, and He knows you're going to do it anyway, at least let's give you, give you guys a fighting chance. Let me give you a man who could be 
if he would choose, you've got some hope of having a good king. That's what he did. <coughs> Listen to this. Moreover, now this is something that 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 Moses is is telling, and it's and Moses is being confident that it is written, and because he knew the time would come, God knew the time would come when these words would mean everything. Moreover. This king, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, since the Lord your God has said to you, you shall never again return that way. What's, what's with horses? I mean, does God hate horses or something? What's this about? You not have horses. Don't multiply horses. Don't go to Egypt. Trade horses. Anyone, what's this about? Anybody know? Well, yeah. Well, there's self-wealth. They're, they're making themselves rich. Right. And there's one more part of it. Right. And, and power. When, when they faced an enemy, if that enemy had horses and chariots, oh man. Well, can you imagine? Imagine you're a little guy. You're, you're a little guy out there. And here comes somebody and he's got he's raging horses there. They're coming, they're coming right at you. And they got the things on the wheels like they show in Spartacus. And if you get caught in your leg, they chew you up. And, and then all this thing is coming. You meet these guys going, oh no. These guys are powerful. So people multiply horses and chariots and people to operate the horses as a sign of power. God's saying, don't do that. First of all, I want you to have a king. Say, Lord, I know you're going to have a king. Okay, I'll help you. I'll give you a man. But even then, don't be doing this. Let's go on. Whether he shall multiply, neither shall he multiply wives for himself. Lest his heart turn away, nor shall he be greatly, nor shall he increase silver and gold for himself. So what's the king supposed to not do? He doesn't tell the king what to do here. At first he says, don't do. When you get a king, even one and I settle and let you have. If you're that king, here's what you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to spend your time trying to gather earthly wealth, horses, chariots. I know you're going to be king. I know you can do what you want to do, but don't be grabbing every woman in sight. Don't do that. Then he says, now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. Now let's get this picture. Let's say that we just made you king. What does God intend to happen? When you're king, you're sitting on your throne, the first thing you write down is what? This. You copy this. You have it in your own handwriting. How many of you know that you remember more if you write it down? Huh? If you if you heard it and you write it, if you've written it and you write it in your own hand, your chances of remembering are much more. And this is what God, God tells Moses before there ever is a king. When they're going to have a king, and now they're going to, you the first thing you do, you have them write this down, and you have them read that themselves. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. How often is the king supposed to read what he copied? <laughs> I mean, he needs to have this thing in his heart. It's not that much, is it? It's not that much. Don't be multiplying horses. Don't be multiplying chariots. Don't be multiplying wives for yourself. And for goodness sakes, don't be counting your wealth and how much silver and how much gold you've got. That's pretty much it. I mean, I redneck the translation, but that's pretty much it. And he says, I want you to read that, King. I want you to read that over and over and over. I want that to be in your heart. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to jump, you to, jump you to something. Second Chronicles. That, that's after First Chronicles, which is where we were. Second Chronicles. How many times, do you know that when, when, when sometimes... We think that it's God blessing us and it's not God's blessing at all. My, my brother sells, sells cars. He did. And, and somebody had, had, had some really hot cars. 
And one at a time, he would give them to my brother, my brother himself, for him on commission. And he had this S10 pickup truck, a small Chevy pickup truck. And the engine had, they put some engine in it, and it had 650 horsepower or something in it. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's like a jet engine on the back of a bumblebee. I mean, it's just hard to imagine. And this man came with his son. And, 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 the, and the son says, well, I, you know, the father says, well, we're thinking about buying this from our son. And the young man says, well, I need to test drive it. And my brother says, no, you're not test driving it. And father, I'm not selling it to you. Because this boy just turned 16. And the father evidently is a fool. Or he somehow was never 16. Or he forgot. And you know what? I remember having a 1960 Chevy Valiant with a 225 slant 6. And I'm trying like everything I can to make that thing peel out. And the only time I could was either in the gravel or, 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 or dirt or when it was wet. I mean, when you're 16 years old, first thing you want to do is see if this puppy will peel out. And you got a little, you got a little truck that weighs about do the squat. You got an engine in it that can move an earth mover. And that thing's got horsepower, tucks an air place. And you're going, put the wool out, put the wool out, wool out. You probably said, that thing's probably going to do anything. Dan said, God, I'll just see what he do. Hit 130 before we knew what to do. Zero to 130. Whoa, 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 you're back now. Dan's not going to give this guy. He's not going to sell this to father because he knows it's going to go to the son. And I guess the people got... I get the people got, you know, kind of a little upset over it, but Dan said if that boy died, it would have been my fault. Because I saw a little sense father who's got more money than sense, and I see what's happening, and I can stop it if I don't sell that. If I don't, if I don't sell that. If that, little, if that young man had got that truck, do you think he would have thought he was blessed? Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine your 16th birthday? You bring all over your, your goofy brothers and your kids and your friends and you're all, you know, Let's go, go, go. here's my new truck. Want to go for a ride? You put everybody in the back. Watch this guy. You think, boy, that's really blessed, wouldn't it? It wouldn't have been a blessing, though, would it? I want, I, want you to, I want you to look at something. Second Chronicles, I'm in chapter one. And we're talking about Solomon. Solomon was a, was a, you know, oh my goodness. Solomon was more blessed of God in intelligence than any other human had ever been. He was more blessed in wisdom than anybody else. And yet, somehow, it didn't keep him from screwing up. Listen to what it says. Now, the words here are intended to be telling about his greatness, how God blessed him. Verse 14, and Solomon amassed, that means he gathered good himself, he collected. And Solomon amassed chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen, and he stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. Did God say to do that? No. Did God say not to do that? He did. So every horse he had, don't praise God for every horse I have. Because God says, I didn't want you to do that. You're a man. You've got free will and you've got power. I've given you the power. You've got the throne. I've given it to you. But what you're doing with it right now, it's like saying, oh Lord, I thank you for helping me to rob this liquor store in Jesus' name. You hear people say, I hear people say things like that. They don't say, that was, I did that stupid on purpose. But, but they'll, they'll, they'll do things that they know that God doesn't want them to do. And they say that the Lord's blessed us. I, I heard a person one time tell me, he said, well, I didn't know if I was supposed to buy. This person doesn't have two nipples to rub together. And he don't have a lot of sense. And he said he went to a car lot. I don't know why we're talking about cars. Went to a car lot. He said, he said now, Lord, I, I, I'm going to Here's how I'm going to know it's your will for me to buy this new car if my loan goes through Guess what? His loan went through. Does that mean it's God's will to buy that car? Go up. I mean, you can't feed your kids. You can't make payments. You can't do anything. But you got a new car. Really? 
He looks like God's blessing. God didn't bless him. God gave him the confidence, gave him the faith. If he listened, he wouldn't have done anything so foolish. Well, he's got horses. He's got chariots. Let, let's go on. Verse 15. And the king made silver and gold as plentiful in Jerusalem as stones. And he made cedar as plentiful as sycamores in the lowland. And Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Cuba. The king's traders procured them from Cuba for a price. Listen to this. And they imported chariots from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver apiece and horses for 150 apiece. And by the same means, listen to this, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Aram. They went into the dealership, for goodness sakes. Not only are they covering themselves axle deep in chariots, but they're, they're opening a dealership. And they don't care who they're selling to, potential enemies or not. That all looks like a blessing, doesn't it? If you, if you came upon them and you saw, man, golly, wow, look how the Lord's blessing. Looked like the Lord's blessing, did it? But it wasn't. Do you believe that the first day Solomon became king, that he sat on his throne and he wrote down these things so important? God said on day one, the day one, you take office, don't be doing anything until you've written these things down. Don't gather horses, but do yourself. Don't gather, don't gather chariots. Don't make your don't make your wealth about silver and gold. Don't don't add wives to yourself. And then you go on. You see if it's in the verse I'm trying to say here. I don't see it right away. Do you know how many wives Solomon would go on to have? Seven. 700 wives. How many concubines would he have? 300. 300. Is, is that going a little overboard? You'd have to have the wisdom of God. I would have had to just call them all honey. <laughs> honey, come here, seven of them. Come on. That looks like a sign of blessing. Is it a sign of blessing? He's just done everything God says not to do. The purpose of this message is David realized it really did him. Yes, I am king. And yes, I just learned a few days ago that God has a purpose and a plan. And when you don't do it his way, Death comes into the king. There's never a time. If you're doing things God's way, there's never a time when you have an excuse for doing stupid things God said not to do. But if you don't keep the word of God before you, you are destined to do stupid. You just are. That's why, as saints of God, we are determined to keep the Word of God in front of us. Right. It'll keep us out of the ditches right. that nearly everybody falls in at one time or another. And the Word will tell you things like, love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. It'll tell you, there is a way that seems right to man, but the way of that leads to death. Words are like, if anybody would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Man, you're going to have to lose your life to follow me. If you're willing to lose it now, you're going to find it in eternity. The word of God, the wisdom of God is given to us in his word. And it's available to us. But if your Bible is the family Bible where your great great granddad wrote down and everybody that's ever been married and is sitting at the coffee table cast, you know, collecting dust, the Bible's not helping you. There was, it's interesting to me, 
This could be a long message, but I'm going to wrap it up, I believe. I do. There was a failed state that was given to David. King David wrote these words in Psalm 119, verse 11. Now, does, does anybody know before you look it up? Once I start it, everybody's going to know. Thy all I said was thy, Travis said. Thy have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How can a person keep themselves out of the ditches and on track? It's so simple. It's so simple. Follow the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And keep the manual handy. Yeah, that's good. Uh, that makes sense, doesn't it? That's good. That makes sense, doesn't it? Love Him with all your heart and keep the manual handy. Go back. If God is so good, I'm gonna, I'll tell you one example. I'll close it. I'm nearly gone. I just got saved April 1st, 1983. I've been saved a couple of months. He took me off alcohol. He took me off tobacco. He took me off marijuana use. He changed my speech. He changed that the nastiest mouth anybody here ever heard. And on the seventh day, I realized he changed that. God's really working in me big time. But a month or two goes by, and I find myself in a relaxed moment. And I'm thinking about the old days. Now, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. I'm not going to do it again, but I'm thinking to myself. You know, there were some good things in those old days, you know. And I'm thinking about, I'm not going to tell you what I'm thinking about. I'm just thinking about it. Because <laughs> if I think about it, then you'll think about it. It's like I say, don't think about it. You're going to, that's all I can think about. It's the thing you said, don't think about it. So I'm not going to tell you what I'm not thinking about. <laughs> but I'll tell you the verse. The whole, I think, I think, not, not my memory, you know, I'm getting older, and I may not have this right. First, first Peter, I think, I'm not positive, I think it's this verse. First, first Peter, first Peter 4, 4, 3. I, I think I got it memorized, but I'm going to try to get it just so I don't, in case I, in case yeah, I. Yeah. No, not yet, I haven't found it myself. Yeah. I know I got it, but mine's underlined. <laughs> the Holy Spirit speaks to me. 1 Peter 4 3. I don't even know there is a 1 Peter. I am a slow learner. And I'm in Matthew so long, the people in our Bible study, they would get tickled at me. Because at our Bible study that met every week, and I'm a brand new believer, and I'm going, ooh, ooh, ooh. I, I'm at the most, I saw the most wonderful scripture. You know, I got to get a whole lot of so wonderful. Everybody's going, well, brother, what was it? I say, it's Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 or whatever. And they're all, and I'm reading and I'm so pumped up. And they're all going, yeah, that's wonderful, wonderful. And the next week I come back. Oh, I found a best. It's got to be the best. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, what is it, brother? It's in Matthew 6, you know, chapter something. They're going, what? They're seeing my progress. It's taking me a week to go up a chapter, you know. <coughs> So I'm not, I don't know I haven't been to 1 Peter. I don't know there is a 1 Peter. Holy Spirit speaks to me right in the middle of me thinking about what I'm not going to let you think about. And don't think about trying to wonder what I'm thinking about. <laughs> Just don't go there. And I'm thinking about this. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. God knows I'm not going to do it. But I'm thinking about it. And God gives me 1 Peter 4, 3. Well, i got to find it. I don't even know where 1 Peter is. And so I finally find it. I go to the front of my Bible because that's where he got them all written down. I don't know. Old Testament, New Testament, I don't know. And I read, and here's what it says. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousals, drinking parties, and abominable idolatry. Do you think it shook my world? Oh my gosh. You talk about immediate repentance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hadn't even done it. 
I mean, I've done those things, but not now. But I, just thinking about it. If you keep the word close to you, God will keep himself close to you. He will. This Bible, this Bible is a living book. You're going, what? I'm telling you, it is living. That scripture could not have been any more real to me than if it had really said, dear brother Mike. And then it, and that's how real it was. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. God has a purpose and a plan in 2911, but it's not going to be the ways you would think. He said his ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. His ways are past finding out. If we're going to follow God and walk with God, guess what we have to do? This is really going to be hard to figure out. We've got to follow God and walk with God. And how can you follow him if you don't know where he is? <laughs> Seek him with all your heart and he will show you where he is. Love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He'll show you what he wants you to do. He'll show you what classes he wants you to take in college. He may show you what classes he doesn't want you to take. He'll get you the one with the right professor. Because sometimes the same thing in a different <coughs> professor is a whole different class. God knows how to do that. He'll find a mate for you. He'll find a job for you. He'll find a ministry for you. <coughs> He'll find a person that needs your help and your touch. He'll get you to him. He'll give you the words. When somebody needs consolation and you can't find the words, he'll give you the words. When you're raising your children and they need to be disciplined, he'll show you how to do it. God will take care of all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, how did I say that so smoothly? I was it's in the Word. Keep the Word close, and He'll keep you close. Open your heart to Him. Lord, I pray that you will help us all. Me too, starting with me. Help us, Lord, to keep our hearts surrendered to you. Lord, we don't want to do our own will. We don't want to do our own thing. We don't want to make our own choices. How can we know what's best, Lord? Only you know. Lord, open the eyes of our heart. Help us to see what you have for us. Open our ears so that we can hear. Give us hearts and, and, and spirits that are easy to work with so you can mold us and make us and make a plan, change a plan, and help us to go with you. Like in, like in one of the places in the Psalms, it says, like a weaned child, let us just be at rest as we follow you making you king of kings and lord of lords. So we don't expect you to make us a king, but we know that those principles are true for us too. Lead us and guide us by your spirit all the days of your life. And someday when our life is done, someday when we leave this earthly sphere and step into heavenly places, help us to hear those words that we long to hear. Well done. Good and faithful servant. We submit to you, Lord, only you know how to do it. Do it in our lives for your glory. And let everything that we say and do, let it be for your honor and let it be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.